Clay Davis opened the map. I think we missed the turn off, Dad. He looked up at a sign as they zipped past it. I think we should have gotten off about a mile back. Clay's mother turned from the front passenger seat and pointed to the map. May I see that, please? Clay refolded the map and handed it to her. She studied the map for a moment in the failing afternoon light. He's right, she said finally. Oh, great. Jessica, Clay's older sister, groaned. She looked out at the gray, leaden sky as raindrops began to splat against the windshield. Now we're never going to get there, she said. Who picked this old inn in the middle of the boondocks anyway? You did, everyone chimed in. Oh, right. Jessica grinned sheepishly. I thought it would be romantic. It's almost a century old. Yeah, Clay said. And if we don't get there soon, we'll be a century old. Don't worry, their dad said as he maneuvered the van into the right lane. We'll take the next exit and double back. More than an hour later, after several wrong turns and some rough roads, Mr. Davis guided the family van over a rickety bridge across a rain-swollen stream. Through the trees, a small village came into view. In the drizzling rain and gathering darkness, the scene looked eerie and uninviting. The stores lining the main street were all closed. The village appeared forsaken. Jessica was the first to say what everyone else was thinking. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. The Traveler's Rest Motel back by the expressway doesn't look so bad. Maybe we should stay there. I'm afraid we don't have a choice. Mr. Davis looked down at the glow of the gauges on the dash. We don't have much gas left and it looks as though that closed gas station over there is the only one in town. Besides, I don't think it would be smart to drive around anymore on these back roads in the rain. Let's just try to find the inn and stay there for tonight. If we don't like it, we can leave in the morning. The rain pelted the windshield. No one spoke as Mr. Davis inched the van down the empty, dismal main street. Clay had the strange feeling that the village wasn't deserted at all. He squinted out into the gloom of nightfall, certain that someone was out there watching them pass. A cold chill made him shiver. You know what it means when you shiver? Jessica said. It means that someone in the future has just walked across your grave. Clay elbowed her playfully. No, it doesn't. It means... Look, there's a light. Mrs. Davis interrupted. That must be it. Through the heavy rain, they could see a dim glow a few hundred yards up on a hillside. Mr. Davis turned at the next corner and headed up the slick hill, then parked. A sudden flash of lightning crackled across the sky, and for a moment the landscape was bathed in a ghostly light. An old Victorian building was hunched against the forested hillside. Dense clumps of trees and bushes seemed to be pressing in around the inn, as if they were trying to push it from its unsteady perch. Mrs. Davis took a deep breath. Well, there's no sense sitting out here in the rain. Let's make a run for it. Clay slipped his arms through the straps of his backpack. Last one in is a drowned rat, he yelled, slamming the door behind him and running through the pelting rain toward the lighted porch. Laughing, he clambered up the wooden steps and under the shelter of the overhang. When he turned to watch the rest of the family struggle across the muddy path, something at the corner of the building caught his eye. A figure, a girl, slipped from the edge of the porch into the darkness. But that was impossible. Who or what would go out into such a storm? Still, something about what he had seen seemed oddly familiar to Clay. Suddenly, he became aware of his dad behind him, holding open the door to the inn. Come on, son, this is no time to daydream. Clay moved toward the door, taking one last look over his shoulder. Shrugging, he stepped inside and was a little startled by the light. The entry hall was warm and cheerful, not what he had expected. A pleasant, gray-haired woman in a crisp flowered dress greeted them. Oh, good heavens, she declared. This is not any sort of night for anyone to be traveling. Come in, come in. There's a warm fire in the parlor. I'm Mrs. Reese, Ellen. Welcome to Dark Acres Inn. I'm afraid we didn't think you were going to make it tonight, so I don't have dinner prepared, but I can put together a warm snack in no time. That sounds great, said Mrs. Davis, but could we go to our rooms first and change out of these damp clothes? Oh gracious, yes. I did prepare rooms just in case. Three, right? My husband will get you settled. Albert, she called. Our guests have arrived. 
Albert, a tall, kind-faced man with a head of thick white hair, sauntered in and helped the Davises with their bags. Do you have a granddaughter? Clay asked. The man tilted his head. No, what makes you ask? Clay motioned toward the door. When I was outside just now, I thought I saw someone step off the porch. I thought maybe it was your granddaughter or something. The two older people glanced at each other quickly. Clay noticed Mrs. Reese nervously fingering the lacy collar of her dress. And sometimes the lightning can play tricks. It can make you think you see things that aren't there. Mr. Reese picked up some luggage. Now, it wouldn't be hospitable for us to let you catch cold. Just follow me and we'll get you all set. He guided them along the hallway and opened the doors to three rooms. If you don't like these, you can take your pick of the rest, he said pleasantly. There's no one else here. These rooms will be fine, said Mr. Davis. We will join you and your wife in the parlor shortly. Once Clay was alone, he dropped his backpack onto a chair and unzipped it. He pulled out a dry sweatshirt, jeans, sneakers, and socks, but he didn't change right away. Instead, he clicked off the light and stood at the window, staring out into the night. Outside, tree branches tossed violently in the rising wind, and lightning flashed. No one could be out there on a night like this, he whispered to himself, then switched the light back on and quickly changed clothes. But when he looked into the mirror to comb his damp hair, he froze. In the reflection, he could see the window behind him. The sad eyes of a pale young girl gazed steadily in at him from outside. Slowly, she raised her tiny, clenched hand and began to knock on the glass. Clay dropped the comb and whirled around to face the window, but now there was nothing but a wind-whipped branch beating against the glass. Another flash of lightning lit up the empty space, and Clay bolted out of the room and headed down to the parlor. As he reached the entryway, he slowed down. How would he explain what he had seen? He didn't want everyone to think he was just a scared kid. Maybe it was just a trick of the light. By the time he had joined his family in the Reese's, Clay had almost convinced himself that nothing had happened until he saw Jessica's face. She kept glancing at the French doors, which appeared to lead to an outside terrace. Clay's dad smiled at him. What took you so long? Mr. Reese was just telling us a little about the area. There's a dam up at the top of this valley with a lake behind it. If it stops raining tomorrow, maybe we can go up and have a picnic. Sounds great, Dad, Clay answered. But like Jessica, he couldn't stop looking at the French doors. They seem so fragile. If there really were something outside, those doors didn't seem strong enough to keep it out. Clay accepted a sandwich and a steaming cup of hot soup for Mrs. Reese, then sat by the fire near his sister. As the adults continued their conversation, he whispered to her, did you see anything strange tonight? Wide-eyed, she looked at him. No. Well, not exactly. That is, it wasn't that I saw anything, but when I was in my room, I had this spooky feeling that I was being watched. I don't like this place. Did you see anything? Clay decided not to make his sister any more frightened than she was. No, he lied. It's just weird here. Jessica's hand shook as she reached for her cup. This place is so old. Do you think it could be haunted? Her gaze flickered toward the French doors again. I feel like we're not as alone here as we think. After they had eaten, the family retired to their rooms. Despite the strange happenings, Clay soon fell sound asleep. But whatever was haunting his waking thoughts seemed to have found its way into his dreams as well. At first, his dream was pleasant. He was in a field near the inn on a warm summer day. He could feel the sun on his face and hear the laughter of a young girl. She began to sing a familiar song, but after a moment or two the song turned into a kind of moan, almost like the sound of the wind. The moan rose to a cry, a cry for help. He tried to reach the girl, but the ground turned to thick mud. He was sinking deeper and deeper, until finally he couldn't breathe. All the while he could hear cries and sobbing, but they were the cries of many people, people in terror. Clay sat up, fully awake, and gaped out the window directly into a pair of mournful eyes. Once again he saw the ashen face of the girl he'd seen earlier. She opened her mouth as if to speak, but Clay only heard the crash of thunder. 
The girl curled her fingers at the base of the window, trying to open it, and then her eyes met Clay's again. As if still in a dream, Clay felt the need to do what the strange girl wanted. He kicked away the blankets, rose slowly, and moved toward the window. The girl's eyes glittered as Clay touched the metal latch. Suddenly a bolt of lightning lit up the sky, and Clay saw that there were dozens of people outside in the storm. They were all dressed in turn-of-the-century clothes, and they were moving toward the inn as if their feet weren't quite touching the ground. A tremendous crack of thunder drowned out Clay's scream as he backed away and turned and raced into the hall. He screamed again as he crashed into his sister. She was shaking violently. There is something out there, Clay. I saw them too. We've got to get Mom and Dad. He flung open the door to his parents' room, but it was empty. Clay and Jessica ran down the hall. Relief washed over them when they saw their parents sitting in the parlor, but the relief lasted only for a moment. When Mr. Davis looked up, his face was strained. Mr. Reese was twisting the dials on a radio, but all it was receiving was static. Come on in, kids, Mr. Davis motioned to them. You might as well know what's going on. It seemed all this rain has weakened the dam. There have been reports on the radio that everyone down below has been evacuated, but the stream has flooded out the road. There's no way we can get out. He smiled to reassure them. But Mr. Reese says we're on high ground and we shouldn't be in danger. Mrs. Davis studied Clay's face, then Jessica's. There's something else wrong. What's the matter? Clay glanced at his sister. We saw something. People. Outside. They were dressed weird, like out of the history books. They were all around the inn. Mr. Reese shut the radio off. Mrs. Reese finally broke the silence. It's them, Albert. They're here for us. What is she talking about? Mrs. Davis demanded. Albert Reese rubbed his eyes and smoothed back his hair with both hands. Nothing. It's just an old story. Tell them, Albert, or I will, the old woman said. Mr. Reese began speaking slowly. This isn't the first inn to stand on this site. There was another one before the flood of 1885. A fine man and his wife ran it. They had a little girl and boy. Those kids were never apart. Then came the storm. It was as bad as this one, or worse. The townsfolk down below were worried about the dam. Word is they took shelter up here, but it didn't do them any good. Mrs. Reese walked to the fireplace. She took down a photograph from among the many on the mantelpiece. Mr. Reese continued the story. It seems the dam did break, and it was worse than anybody thought it would be. The water raged down this valley with a vengeance. It washed away the inn. Nobody survived. He sighed heavily. Some folks think that when people die violently like that, they don't rest. Some folks here in the valley say that when it rains, they can't hear the moans of the dead on the wind. But those were good, hard-working people. I don't see why they would want to harm anyone. You're not telling me you believe in ghosts? Mr. Davis asked with surprise. I grew up around here, the old man answered. There have been times when the rain was real bad and the wind howled through the trees like... Well, I'm not one to scoff. This is the family that owned the inn. Mrs. Reese turned the photograph so the others could see it. It was of a man and woman in turn-of-the-century clothes. Seated in front of them were a boy and girl holding hands. My goodness, Jessica gasped. Clay, the boy looks just like you. Clay said nothing. He stared at the face of the girl. It was the same face that had gazed in the window at him. A bolt of lightning crackled. Seconds later, thunder shook the inn as if it were trying to pound it to the ground. The lights went dead, leaving the parlor lit only by the flickering fire. A tremendous gust of wind crashed open the French doors and rain poured in, but no one moved to close them. Standing just beyond the entrance was something that had once been a little girl. Her dull blonde curls hung limply around her pale face, and her sodden dress was streaked with mud. A few yards away on either side of her were others who appeared to have shared her fate. The girl's eyes were locked onto Clay's as she raised her small hand and motioned for him to follow her. Without thinking, he began to walk toward the doorway. Clay, no! His mother grabbed at him, but he quickly slipped into the downpour. 
The wind ripped at his clothes and the rain drenched him, but he was no longer in control. He had to go with her. Slipping and sliding in the mud, he struggled up the hillside after the phantom girl. We've got to stop him. Clay! His mother screamed. Come on, Mr. Reese said to Mr. Davis. We'll stop him. The two men ran out to the downpour. At that moment, the front door to the inn slammed open. Seeming to float just above the ground, several figures entered and drifted toward the parlor. Jessica shrieked. Mom, what are they? What do they want? In terror, she questioned her mother. Mrs. Davis picked up a lamp from the table and threw it at the specters, but they kept advancing. The air became thick with the smell of damp earth and mildew. We've got to get out, said Mrs. Reese, shaking with fear. She snatched a blanket from the arm of the couch and threw it around Jessica's shoulders. The two women and Jessica ran into the storm after the others. Driven by fear, they climbed higher up the slick hillside. Far above, Clay stumbled to his knees. He tried to get up again, but realized that something had him by the ankle. The rain had eased and the sky had begun to lighten with the approaching dawn. Clay looked down and saw that it was his father who was gripping him tightly. No, Dad, he squirmed. Let me go. I've got to go to her. Suddenly, Clay heard distant thunder, and at the same time he realized that the ground was shaking. The roaring grew louder as Mrs. Reese, Mrs. Davis, and Jessica scrambled up the hill. Seconds later, a raging wall of water tore through the valley below. It ripped up trees and sent boulders flying. The mud-choked waters fell upon the inn like a savage beast and ripped it to pieces, carrying away what was left. The six people huddled against the hillside, safe from the deluge. The phantoms stood below at the edge of the water, and as the day grew brighter, they faded into the flood, one by one. Saints preserve us. Mrs. Reese said, holding on to her husband. If it hadn't been for them, we would have been in that building. Clay looked up at the fading form of the girl above him. She held out her hand and smiled. He reached out and brushed her fingertips just before she vanished. Thank you, he whispered, hoping that she could hear him.